jumping, caking, or other signs of physical incompatibility. The proper sequence for adding pesticides to the spray tank is the same order used in the quart jar compatibility test. Let's review some of the application situations where high exposure may require additional protection. Hand-carried equipment can give high exposure from a dripping nozzle or leaky hose. Applying a pesticide in an orchard with an air blast sprayer will give far greater exposure than the same pesticide applied through a boom sprayer with the applicator in an enclosed cab. Other practices that can give high exposure are working in an area being treated without protective clothing, working in a recently treated area without protective clothing, immersing the hands in a pesticide while dipping a plant, and spraying in an enclosed area without extra precautions. Certain procedures need to be performed regularly during pesticide applications. These include ensuring a uniform deposition and delivery rate and safe equipment operation. This equipment appears to be applying the pesticide uniformly and operating under good environmental conditions. Avoid getting the pesticide onto non-target organisms and watch for people in the area. Here an applicator is telling a field worker to leave the field he's about to spray. If you are applying pesticides at a distance from your equipment, at the end of a long hose, for example, be sure that unprotected people and pets stay away from the equipment. After mixing, loading, and applying pesticides, clean the equipment immediately. Avoid washing equipment repeatedly in the same location unless you use a containment pad. Over time, a frequently used unprotected area can become highly contaminated and increase the likelihood of leaching or runoff into water systems. Wear proper protective clothing when cleaning equipment. Note the containment pad being used at the wash site. Leftover spray in the tank can corrode equipment. Liquid pesticides left in the tank may undergo chemical changes, settle out, or separate into two or more separate liquids that do not remix. It is best to spray out the tank over a crop or site approved on the label. Remember that the rinse aids you create when you clean your equipment contain pesticides. You may use equipment rinse aid as a diluent for future mixtures if the pesticide in the rinse aid is labeled for the target site of the new mixture. The pesticide in the rinse aid plus the new pesticide added does not exceed the label rate. The dilute contains the same pesticide as the new mix and you comply with label directions. You cannot add the rinseate to a pesticide mixture if the pesticide labeling does not list the rinseate as an acceptable diluent. The rinseate contains strong cleaning agents that might harm the target and the rinseate is incompatible and would alter the mixture. When you finish working, take the time to wash your personal protective equipment and Take a shower and wash your whole body and hair with a mild liquid detergent and plenty of water. Keeping records of pesticide use and application is recommended. Records may help you determine the cause if a problem occurs with a particular pesticide, a particular formulation, type of application, or some condition in the treatment area. Record keeping gives proof of proper use, helps find errors or problems, helps determine cause if there are excessive pesticide residues or damage claims, helps to determine how much pesticide to buy, which in turn reduces carryover and reduces storage and disposal. Federal regulations require both commercial and private certified applicators to keep certain records of restricted use pesticides. The 1992 worker protection regulations require that agricultural pesticide handlers and agricultural workers receive training to protect them from exposure to pesticides. Safety systems have been developed for closed mixing and loading of pesticides. 
Also available are soluble packages of pesticides, special protective clothing, and enclosed application cabs and cockpits. Here's a closed system that removes the pesticide from the container, meters it, transfers it to a tank, and even rinses the empty container without human exposure. Collection pads and trays should be made of non-porous materials, have containment walls high enough to retain the largest possible spill, have a system for pumping and filtering back into storage tanks, and be located where water cannot flow into them. Shown here is a cement containment pad under and surrounding a pesticide storage area. Remember to read all labeling before mixing, loading, or applying pesticides. It is a violation of federal and state law to use a pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. We'll take a look at chapter nine, mixing, loading, and application. Again, we'll go to the first paragraph, mixing, loading, and application, the primary pesticide handling task. They are also among the most hazardous. And in the paragraph next, the one below that paragraph, it makes the statement, and then you may see a little bit later today, pesticide handlers are most often exposed to harmful amounts of pesticides when mixing or loading concentrated pesticides. Again, have to be careful at all uh, phases when using pesticides, but when you're mixing and loading uh, concentrated pesticides, really have to be careful. Remember in an earlier uh, chapter, we talked about uh, oh, protecting your water source and keeping uh, pesticides from, back, from uh, flowing back into the main water uh, supply. On, on page three, they give you uh, a couple of little sentences here uh, and mention several devices that you can use to help prevent that. And this usually pops up on the test, what, what to do to prevent uh, flowing of a pesticide back into the main water supply, using a check valve, anti-siphoning device, or backflow preventer. So remember that, check valve, anti-siphoning device, or backflow preventer. Um, also on page four, a comment that might pop up on the test by law, it's right here on the left column, about halfway down, a little bit more than halfway down. By law, you must use all of the personal protective equipment that the pesticide labeling requires. It says here for mixers and loaders, but that's also during application. And if you don't feel comfortable with that level of uh, pest, uh, personal protective equipment recommendations, then up that, increase that level. They will usually give you the minimum levels of uh, personal protective equipment uh, or clothing, et cetera, that you must wear. But if you, if you want to enhance that, you need to do that. If you don't feel comfortable, then increase that, okay? Transferring pesticides, this is mentioned over on page five, down at the very left column here, when pouring pesticides from a container to a, in a sprayer or container to container, keep the pesticide uh, in the container below face level. We don't wanna be pouring up here. This is where accidents happen when you're up here. Uh, that may also mean the lighting is not good. So you need to be in a well-lit location, keep the pesticide out here, never above your head. It's very likely then the pesticide can get into your uh, eyes or on your skin and your head. On page six, they talk about pressure rinsing or actually cleaning containers using either pressure rinsing or triple rinsing. Pressure rinsing, uh, you have a simple device gun that you stick into the side of the container and squeeze the trigger and rotate and it pressure rinses that container. So then you can dispose of the container or recycle the container. We also have triple rinsing, put water in the container, shake it, uh, do that three times and you triple rinse the container to get all of that pesticide out of the container. They talked about compatibility charts. The best thing there is to go online and find compatibility charts if you wanna to try to mix an insecticide with a fungicide and you'll you'll have a combination product, but you have to be sure they're compatible, that they will mix together without some side effects and so forth. And they went through that process. Um, also, at the very end of the chapter, they talk a little bit about record keeping. That's a must, you just have to do that. Records can establish proof of proper use, can save you money, you can keep up better with your inventory, 
Uh, you can learn if you happen to make a mistake, but also if you happen to go into court, small claims or court, and you don't have any records, uh, you're going to be in, it's not going to be a happy day. Let me just put it to you like that. Or a happy life, perhaps, from that day forward. So you need to have records and very good records of everything you do. And you can go online and get pesticide uh, application records or log sheets and they'll probably be available this afternoon through the, uh, the people with the Department of Agriculture. The last thing they mentioned in this chapter, collection pads. A pad is a, a suitable area for mixing, loading, uh, cleaning equipment. The question that usually pops up on the test is not what is a collection pad, but what should a collection pad be made out of? Any waterproof material such as seal, smooth concrete, glaze, ceramic tile, or no wax sheet flooring. And most are usually concrete, and that's on page 18, the top left corner up on page 18. We go back to the beginning of the chapter. There are again a number of terms, active ingredients, back siphoning, delayed effects, drift. If you'll just review the terms to know in this chapter, in chapter eight, you will probably see all the terms because they are both large blocks of terms. And I think everything that we've talked about are covered there. Applying the correct amount. So how much should I apply? The correct rate is very important. The label will give you the answer for the pesticide in question. The answer for how much to apply to each crop, animal, and site will be under the directions for use on the label. If the crop, animal, or site you want to use this pesticide on is not listed, it is illegal to use it. If you apply too little pesticide, it's expensive because you may get poor results. If you apply too much, it's not only more expensive, but you may also harm the crop, animal, or site and have illegal residues. How do you know how much you're applying? The answer is by proper mixing, loading, and calibration. Calibration refers to adjusting your application equipment so that it will apply the correct amount of pesticide to the target site. Read the label directions carefully. For pesticides that must be mixed, rates may be based on the amount of formulation per acre, or amount of active ingredient per acre, or volume or percent of the final dilution. For example, if the label called for one pound of active ingredient per acre of a 50% wettable powder, you would need two pounds of the formulation per acre. If the label called for one pound of formulation of a 75% WP per acre, you would need one pound of 75% WP per acre. Unless the pesticide is a ready-to-use formulation, you must combine the right amount of the concentrated pesticide and the diluent to make the amount of mixture you need. Shown here is a wettable powder being pre-mixed with a small volume of water before it is added to the spray tank for further mixing. Mix pesticides outdoors where you have good ventilation. Some pesticide formulations are sold at application strength already in the applicator and need no mixing, loading, or calibration. Examples are some squeeze trigger sprayers, baits, and as shown here, aerosol cans. Some ready to use pesticides are not sold in the pesticide application equipment. No mixing is necessary, but the user must load the chemical into the equipment, such as a squeeze trigger sprayer. Usually no calibration is needed. Some ready-to-use pesticides, such as most dust and granular formulations, will need to have the equipment calibrated. Some concentrated pesticides are diluted and then loaded into equipment that does not require calibration, such as animal or plant dips, tree canopy sprays, or hand sprayers. The label may instruct to cover the plant or animal thoroughly, or, as with a hand sprayer, apply to the point of runoff. 
Many concentrated pesticides need to be applied with equipment that is calibrated. The concentrate must be diluted correctly and the equipment calibrated correctly. If there is an error in either dilution or calibration, the wrong amount of pesticide will be applied. Pesticide applications involving equipment that must be calibrated are most common. To correctly calibrate your equipment, you must have appropriate equipment for the job, use correct nozzles in good working order and all of the same type, drive at a predetermined vehicle speed, and set a specified dispersal pressure. Nozzles are very important in calibration. Some are for band use, some for broadcast. Some nozzles will apply small amounts of spray, some large amounts. Some are made for high pressure and some for low pressure applications. Shown here is an even flat fan nozzle. It's for low pressure spraying and will apply an even amount of pesticide across the band. If you need several nozzles for one application situation, make sure they all put out the same amount. Collect the output from each nozzle for a given time or distance. If a nozzle output varies more than 5% from the average, discard it. Here is a man checking several nozzles for uniformity by catching the output for a given time. Check for clogging if a nozzle is distributing less. If a nozzle is putting out too much, it's probably worn. This man will discard nozzles not putting out the correct amount. If the equipment you've chosen uses gravity to maintain the flow of pesticides, calibration may be fairly simple. Some equipment, such as granule spreaders, needs to be calibrated only to adjust the rate of flow. This equipment releases pesticide only when the wheels are turned. If your equipment has a pump or other mechanism to disperse pesticide, you'll need to determine the rate of speed the equipment will be driven or pulled through the target area. This will be one factor determining the amount of pesticide applied in a given area. The equipment manufacturer's directions may offer a range of appropriate speeds and recommended pressures. Once you have calibrated based on a certain speed, don't change speed. Decreasing your speed by 50% will increase the rate of output by 50%. Calibration usually requires you to operate the equipment over a pre-measured distance. This slide outlines the common steps to check a calibration. Number one, measure volume of the tank in gallons. Number two, operate the equipment over a pre-measured distance at your chosen speed, pressure, and nozzle types. Number three, measure the amount to refill the tank. You determine application rate of gallons per acre by setting up a proportion. In this example, if it took one gallon to spray a thousand square feet, you would be applying 43.5 gallons in 43,560 square feet. Since there are 43,560 square feet in an acre, you would be applying 43.5 gallons per acre. In another example, this slide shows that 100 ounces of spray water was caught while covering 1,000 square feet. In a proportion, this would be 4,356 ounces on 43,560 square feet, or an acre. The 4,356 ounces per acre converts to 34 gallons per acre, since there are 128 fluid ounces per gallon. If you're using small equipment or have a relatively small target site, you can use a smaller test site for calibration and by multiplying, convert to a larger area. If the target site is a rectangle, circle, or triangle, you can use measurements and geometric formulas to determine its size. Irregular shaped sites often can be reduced to a combination of rectangles, circles, and triangles. Calculate the areas of each and add them together to obtain the total area. If you find you're not putting out the correct rate, you can make changes in one or more of three possible ways. For big changes, changing the size opening of your nozzle is best. 
Another choice is to change your pressure, but you will need to increase pressure four times to double the output. Increasing pressure will decrease the spray particle size and increase the chance for drift. And last, you can change your speed. Once you have calibrated your equipment, do not assume that it will continue to deliver the same rate during all future applications. Wettable powders will enlarge brass nozzle openings. Nozzles may get clogged. If you find you are covering more or less area than you originally figured, recheck your calculations and equipment. When you measure pesticides or diluents, use graduated utensils for accuracy. Inaccurate measurements can lead to underdosing, overdosing, too much pesticide left in the tank, or the wrong strength of pesticide mixture. Do not assume the graduated marks on your spray tank are accurate. For large tanks, use a flow meter and mark measured volumes on the tank or mark a dipstick. If you fail to control a pest, do not increase the dose over the label rate. Get advice concerning what in your procedure went wrong. If you need help calibrating your equipment, get help. It's as close as your nearest county extension agent. All right, we're at chapter 10, applying the correct amount. And again, the first paragraph, one of the most important tasks for a pesticide applicator is making sure that the correct amount of pesticide is being applied. We're gonna have the best equipment and the best protective equipment and the nicest caps and gloves and so forth, but if we're not using the correct amount of pesticide, then it's all for nothing, pretty much. Uh, in the very first column in this paragraph on the left side, they talk about underdosing and overdosing. That might pop up on the test. Underdosing is expensive. Uh, you don't apply, apply enough pesticide. You apply too little pesticide. That means you probably won't control the pest. Then you have to go in and repeat the situation. Then you have uh, more time, money, effort tied up in that second application. And then you may actually overdose if you're not careful. Overdosing is expensive, time consuming, etc. When you use too much pesticide, then you have to be careful that you don't get into plant toxicity, plant burn, scorch, or death, uh, or illegal uh, crop residues, pesticide residues, etc. So that's underdosing and overdosing. Also on page three, uh, deciding how much to apply. This usually pops up on the test. Um, and it says, study the directions for use. That's probably what they want to know. Directions for use section on the pesticide label or labeling to find out how much pesticide you should apply. Study the directions for use. The, the remaining part of this uh, chapter deals with mixing, loading, and calibration alternatives, different ways that we uh, go about mixing, loading, and calibration. In some cases, we don't do anything. We don't mix anything, we don't load anything, we don't calibrate anything, like a little squeeze trigger, like some houseplant sprays come in a squeeze trigger, and you just simply squeeze the trigger. You didn't have to load anything, you didn't have to mix anything, you didn't have to calibrate anything. When you run out of the uh, insecticide, then you may have to add more, so you may have to mix something and then add it, so you may then have to mix and load, didn't have, and you may have to calibrate. In some cases, maybe with a drop spreader, uh, for instance, and you're using a weed and feed, um, no mixing needed, there's no mixing uh, to that, but you do have to calibrate and load that drop spreader. spreader. In some cases, you have to do everything. You have to uh, mix, load, and calibrate. So just remember that, mixing, loading, and calibration. They also talked about, in the video, ways to alter the rate of output, and they mentioned two specific ways, uh, changing the pressure and changing the speed. Uh, if you want to make big time wholesale changes into output or rate of output, then you get into changes in your nozzles and nozzle size. But speed and pressure will determine rate. Um, over on page Eight, they talk about certain land measures as far as calibrating equipment. Um, if you're dealing in 
a farm operation, which we've seen numerous farm scenes up here because we use this tape statewide for not only landscape and green industry, but for farm and row crop production and so forth. Normally, those people, farmers, will calibrate their equipment on an acre basis. Uh, they'll use an acre to, to pull a spray or a big rig and calibrate. And they'll probably ask you on the test how many square feet are in an acre. 43,560, 43560 square feet in an acre. When you're dealing with smaller areas, with homeowners, uh, parks, golf courses, you'll probably calibrate on 1,000 square feet. 43,560 square feet in an acre, and they'll probably ask you that. Uh, always use uh, and measure accurately and use, uh, for instance, graduated cylinders, uh, accurate measuring devices and so forth to be sure that you're using the precise amount of product that you sow then that you don't overdose or underdose. Determining target size, they had a visual in the video of Say you wanted to spray an area, a landscape situation, and you had round flower beds and blocked areas and square areas and rectangles. How would you ask, how would you know how many square feet you have? It goes back to some of that math that you learned in middle school or junior high school when I was coming along. Uh, like the rectangle or block is the length times the width. 20 times 50 is 1,000 square feet, that's a block. How about a triangle, one half the base times the height? Or a circle, power squared. So you thought, well, I'll never use all this uh, math, you know, that I learned back in the sixth, seventh grade or something. Well, that's just that simple. Then you add those areas together and then you have your square footage so you'll know exactly how much to spray. Okay, with that, uh, let's see, in terms to know active ingredients, Chemicals in a pesticide product that control the target pest. And dilute, anything used to dilute a pesticide. So I think most of these terms are beginning to pop up over and over again. Uh, two more chapters, so we'll, we'll, we've got chapter 11 next, transportation, storage, and disposal cleanup. Normally we don't think a lot about transportation of chemicals, but it can be important. Also storage, very important disposal and spill cleanup. So if you'd like to turn over to chapter 11 in the book, we'll look at that particular portion of the video. Transportation, storage, disposal, and spill cleanup. Be sure to read the label for any special instructions for proper transportation, storage, disposal, and spill cleanup directions. Transport pesticides tied down or otherwise secured in the back of a truck. You don't want to risk an accidental spill. Steel or plastic lined beds are best because they are more easily cleaned if a spill does occur. Never transport pesticides with food, animal feed or clothing, or with people. This driver should not leave his vehicle unattended while hauling pesticides. You will be responsible if curious children or careless adults are accidentally poisoned by pesticides. Typical pesticide label instructions about transportation include, do not transport in or on vehicles containing foodstuffs or feeds. In case of a transportation emergency involving a spill, call the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center or Chemtrek, one 800 424-9300. This number is for emergencies only. Store pesticides by themselves. Put up a sign and put a lock on the door or cabinet. A pesticide storage area should have a smooth cement floor for easy cleanup, good lighting to read labels, and good ventilation. There should be temperature control to prevent liquids from freezing or overheating. The shelving should be made of a non-absorbent material, such as metal, and the building should have fire-resistant construction. Store pesticides in their original containers. Never put pesticides in containers that might cause children or other people to mistake them for food or drink. Remember, every pesticide label says, keep out of reach of children. Clean running water or a sealable container of water should be readily available in the storage area for emergencies. 
A basic cleanup kit should also be easy to reach and should include a broom, mop and shovel, absorbent material such as kitty litter or sawdust, and buckets and plastic bags. Do not allow pesticide labels to become illegible. If a label begins to deteriorate, use transparent tape to help protect it or transfer the contents to another pesticide container with exactly the same label or request a replacement from your dealer. Pesticides with no labels are risky to use and become a disposal problem. Inspect containers regularly for tears, splits, leaks, rust, or corrosion. When a container is damaged, you may use the pesticide immediately at a site and rate allowed by the label. Transfer the pesticide into another container with the same label. Transfer the pesticide and its label to a sturdy, appropriate container that can be tightly closed. Or place the entire damaged container inside another container, being careful that the label remains clearly legible. Herbicides should be stored separately from other pesticides to reduce the risk of any mix-ups that could damage plants. Keep an up-to-date inventory of the pesticides you have in storage and when you obtain them. Some pesticides have a relatively short shelf life. You should try to never order more than you expect to use within a year. Pesticide labeling may contain a warning statement requiring extra precautions such as store at temperatures above 32 degrees Fahrenheit or flammable, do not use, pour, spill, or store near heat or open flame, do not cut or weld container. Some pesticide applicators and dealers may be affected by the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act of 1986 known as SARA Title III. This is administered by the EPA and requires you, under certain conditions, to notify the State Emergency Response Commission and Local Emergency Planning Commission about the location and amount of hazardous chemicals on your site. Inventories which require reporting include all hazardous chemicals stored in quantities of 10,000 pounds or more and all extremely hazardous chemicals stored in quantities of 500 pounds or more. Agricultural producers are exempt from reporting inventories, however. SARA also requires all pesticide handlers to report spills. If the pesticide is extremely hazardous, the chemical is covered under the SARA Act, the amount spilled exceeds a specified quantity, or the spill could cause off-site exposure. If you have excess pesticides that are usable, your best option is to apply them at a rate and on a crop or site listed on the label. If you don't need the product, trade, sell, or give it to someone who can use it. What you don't want to do is to store a pesticide until all uses have been canceled or the pesticide is so old it's unusable. You then have a disposal problem. If you have excess pesticides or rinsates that cannot be legally used, then they must be disposed of as pesticide wastes. Waste pesticides include spills and saturated clothing. Pesticide wastes can sometimes be disposed of in special EPA landfills. Most sanitary landfills are not suitable or they can be incinerated at EPA-approved sites or collected by licensed hazardous waste companies. You should never burn, bury, or dump pesticides. Empty pesticide containers can be a real problem if not disposed of properly. Check the label for instructions. A properly rinsed pesticide container is considered a solid waste, not a hazardous waste. Most sanitary landfills will accept triple rinsed or pressure rinsed containers that have been properly cleaned, have a hole punched in them, and are crushed if possible. It is essential that rinsing be done soon after the container is emptied. There's always a pesticide residue lining the inside of the container. 
If this is allowed to dry before rinsing, as in this container, it may be very difficult to remove it. A properly rinsed plastic container can also be taken to a plastic recycling center. Be sure to store your containers in a clean, dry location or within large plastic bags. Containers must be clean inside and out for recycling. There are usually inspectors at the site to check containers before they're accepted. Even cardboard containers, such as those used for some dry pesticides, should be properly emptied and can usually be taken to a sanitary landfill. Open burning of pesticide containers is not permitted. Follow all disposal regulations. Even if containers are clean, dumping is illegal. After mixing and loading pesticides, clean up the site. Containment pads will ensure the material is contained. A spill is any accidental release of a pesticide. Your response to a spill should include control, stop the source of the release. Containment, confine the spill with kitty litter, diking, or other methods. And cleanup, sweep or shovel up and decontaminate the site. Small spills can be quickly contained by kitty litter, sawdust, or even soil. Sweep or shovel the absorbed material into a plastic bag and treat it as a pesticide waste. Put on the necessary protective clothing before beginning cleanup and stay at the spill site to keep others away. Keep the spill out of any body of water or pathway that leads to water such as a ditch or floor drain. The availability of absorbent material, a shovel or rake may be essential in the pesticide handling area to deal with emergencies. Do not hose down a contaminated site with water. On a non-porous surface, use a strong detergent to remove the residue from the surface. Place fresh absorbent material over the wash solution until it's all soaked up, then sweep up. Neutralizing a spill is often handled by mixing full-strength bleach with hydrated lime and working this mixture into the spill site with a coarse broom. Spread on fresh absorbent and sweep up. If a spill occurs on soil, the top two to three inches of contaminated soil can be removed and disposed of as pesticide waste. For minor spills, you may be instructed to mix activated charcoal into the soil, cover the site with two or more inches of lime, and then cover with fresh topsoil. If you have a pesticide spill of significant size or involving other people, be sure to keep records of your containment and cleanup activities. Photographs help to document damage and cleanup. Don't trash it. We live in a beautiful state. Let's keep it that way. All righty, chapter 11, transportation storage, disposal and spill cleanup. Um, transportation of pesticides, a couple of, um, actually four points here they want you to remember. You are responsible for the safe transport of pesticides in your possession and sometimes we don't really think about pesticides, transporting pesticides. In the clip art here, they show you a pesticide actually spilling out or dropping out, possibly on the highway, which could be a disaster anywhere, but you just imagine 285 or something like that. If something rolled off and then wrecked, multiple wreck, chemical involved, not a happy day or life. Uh, never carry pesticides in the passenger section of your car, van, or truck. People break that rule all the time. Never allow children, other passengers, pets to ride with pesticides. And probably the one that most people break, never transport pesticides with food, clothing, or other items meant to be eaten. And a lot of people just throw their lunch box or sack right up next to the sprayer and never even give it a second thought. But if you do that every day over a while, then you might have some of those delayed or chronic effects that'll pop up down the road one day. And then lastly, never leave your vehicle unattended uh, when transporting pesticides in an unlocked truck. Uh, very, very few people um, will observe that ruling, but that could get you in trouble, so be very careful there. On page four and five, they talk about storage of pesticides. Uh, should be in a locked 
facility with signage denoting the fact that uh, pesticides contained inside or careful pesticides located inside. Um, the storage area should be dry. It should be uh, not overly hot. Pesticides that get hot will separate. If they freeze, sometimes they can separate and then you have a, a, a pesticide that you have to dispose of. It won't, once it separates, in many cases it's very hard to get that pesticide back into true solution. Uh, so be sure to control the temperature, adequate lighting. If this is an area where you store pesticides and mix, you need adequate lighting and ventilation. Be sure you have uh, airflow and so forth. Keep pesticides in the original containers. You noticed in the video what happens when you put a brush kill or any pesticide in an old uh, cola bottle or other container. Accidents can happen, so forth. Excess pesticides, occasionally the Department of Agriculture will have a amnesty day or for pesticides uh, where you can actually bring that pesticide and drop it off and in fact they do that uh, here uh, on occasion at North Metro Tech and at Gwinnett Tech and other locations around the state and metro area. A spill, a spill is any accidental release of a pesticide. Probably, they'll probably ask you that on the test. What is a pesticide spill? An ac any accidental release of a pesticide. Hope that never happens, but if you deal with pesticides a lot, eventually you probably will spill some or drop a container and so forth. So it's always handy to have a spill kit available. And if nothing else, just a broom, a dustpan, and some kitty litter, if nothing else. But they do give you on page 14 a list of uh, items that you have or should have, say back at the shop or wherever you mix pesticides protective eyewear, um, an absorbing agent, a commercial absorbing agent, although kitty litter will work, an absorbent material, approved absorbent material, appropriate respirator, shovel broom, dustpan, heavy duty detergent, even perhaps a fire extinguisher, and so forth. Uh, that is a spill uh, kit. The three C's to spill, uh, to a spill, or to spill management. They'll probably ask you that on the test. That's on page 11. Uh, control, contain, and clean up. Those are called the three C's of a spill management uh, situation. Control the spill, protect yourself, stop the source, protect others. Contain the spill so it won't continue to spread, protect water sources, and uh, then the actual cleanup itself. Um, at the beginning of this chapter, there may be a few terms, but I suspect everything now has been covered. Chemical resistant, able to prevent movement of the pesticide through a material during the use of that pesticide. So a material is considered chemical resistant. And remember we talked about some materials that, were, that offered good chemical resistant properties and some that don't, like cotton and, and canvas don't. Exposure, coming into contact with a pesticide, getting a pesticide, uh, say, on your skin. Toxicity, measure of a pesticide's ability to cause acute, delayed, or allergic effects. Toxicity, that's the measure of, of that pesticide to cause acute, delayed, or allergic effects. Okay. All right, we're down to the last chapter, so if we'll turn over to page, uh, or actually chapter 12, unit 12, chapter 12, Georgia Laws and Regulations. Georgia Laws and Regulations. The Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, gives broad powers to the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate pesticides. FIFRA regulations require registration of all pesticides by the EPA. Use only as labeling directs. Classification of restricted use pesticides. Certification of all users of restricted use pesticides. That state regulations may be stricter than EPA, but not less strict and penalties for violations. Shown here is a restricted use pesticide.
Pesticides are classified restricted use. If they could cause unreasonable adverse effects on the environment or humans, even when used as directed by the labeling. Is our food free from harmful pesticide residues? Yes, if the correct pesticide is used at the proper rate and time, is applied according to label directions, and if the delay before harvesting, called the pre-harvest interval, is obeyed. This is the time in hours or days you must wait between the last application and harvest. Each pesticide used on a food crop is allowed a certain residue or tolerance as expressed in parts per million. The food is considered safe if it doesn't exceed the tolerance level. FIFRA delegates much of its regulatory authority to the states if the state passes laws and regulations to assume these powers and responsibilities. The application and use of pesticides and pesticide containers in Georgia are regulated under the Georgia Pesticide Use and Application Act of 1976. This act is administered by the Georgia Department of Agriculture, Entomology, and Pesticide Division. There are two types of certification required for anyone using a restricted use pesticide, private and commercial. Private pesticide applicator certification is required for all who use a restricted use pesticide to raise an agricultural commodity on their own land or that of their employer. You can receive a private applicator's license by attending a training course provided by your county extension office or by taking an examination from the Georgia Department of Agriculture. To keep your license, you must earn three hours of recertification training credit every five years by attending certain county growers meetings or other meetings approved by the Georgia Department of Agriculture. If you wish to apply restricted use pesticides and do not meet the definition of a private applicator, you are considered a commercial pesticide applicator under FIFRA. Georgia law is stricter than FIFRA in this respect, requiring that applicators who charge a fee must have a commercial license even if they don't use a restricted use pesticide. To obtain a commercial pesticide applicator's license, you must pass an examination on this manual and on the appropriate categorical manual. Commercial applicators must earn from six to 10 hours of recertification training credit, depending on the category, every five years to maintain their license. The Georgia Department of Agriculture will mail you a booklet, Training Sources for Recertifying Georgia Pesticide Applicators, that lists most of the meetings at which training credits can be earned. Do not wait until the last year of your certification to seek retraining credits. All commercial pesticide applicators who are applying pesticides to lands of another for a fee must have a pesticide contractor's license, proof of financial responsibility, and an annual license fee of $15 are required. The licensed pesticide contractor must keep records of all pesticide applications that are made as a part of his business. Any licensed commercial pesticide applicator who is not currently operating under a pesticide contractor's license must also keep records, but only of all restricted use pesticides used. All motorized application equipment that is used in applying pesticides for a fee must be registered by the Georgia Department of Agriculture. The Georgia Pest Control Act of 1976 gives authority to the Georgia Department of Agriculture to regulate the distribution and sale of pesticides in Georgia. All pesticides sold in Georgia must be registered by the Georgia Department of Agriculture as well as the EPA. This act also requires that all pesticide dealers who sell restricted use pesticides have a license from the Georgia Department of Agriculture and agree to keep sales records of restricted use pesticides. The Department of Agriculture will routinely check the sales records of restricted use pesticide dealers to be sure they are selling these chemicals only to certified applicators. If you violate FIFRA, Civil penalties can be as much as $5,000 for commercial applicators, and criminal penalties as much as $25,000, or one year in prison, or both. 
In October 1976, Congress passed the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. This act was intended to protect human health and the environment from improper hazardous waste activities. In order to carry out the provisions of this act, Georgia followed with passage of the Georgia Hazardous Waste Management Act of 1979. Anyone who, during a single month, generates more than 2.2 pounds of a pesticide waste classified as acutely hazardous, or 220 to 2,200 pounds of a pesticide classified as hazardous, is considered to be a generator. Generators must meet certain reporting and disposal requirements. If you generate pesticide waste or have excess pesticides to dispose of, and are uncertain about their classification or disposal regulations, you should contact the Generator Compliance Unit in the Georgia Environmental Protection Division or the Hazardous Waste Technical Assistance Program at Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech is your best source. Under the Georgia Hazardous Waste Management Act, any applicator can be subject to a civil penalty of up to $25,000 for each day a violation exists and a criminal penalty of $50,000 for each day of violation plus up to two years in prison for knowingly committing violations. Pesticides are essential to preserve our standard of living but they are designed to kill something and many can be toxic to man or the environment unless used carefully. Due to Georgia's varied geography and climate, we are blessed with a beautiful state from our coasts and wetlands to our coastal plains and mountainous areas. When handling pesticides, the best contribution you can make to preserving our health and our state's beauty is to read and follow the labeling. A few things that you may see on the test from chapter 12, because pesticides are designed to harm or kill something, we have to have certain laws and regulations. FIFRA, they may ask you on the test, what is FIFRA, F-I-F-R-A? That's a federal law, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. In 1976, then the state of Georgia passed their Pesticide uh, Use and Application Act. They may ask you that. Uh, pesticide contractor's license. This is a company license required of anyone engaged in the business of applying pesticides to the lands of another. That's different now from the pesticide restricted permit uh, training that you're going through here today. That's a pesticide contractor's license. Um, also, those uh, companies, businesses which sell restricted pesticides must have a restricted use pesticide dealer's license, just something to remember. In the video, so you won't be confused, now once you go through the testing today and pass and get your permit, you know you have to have certain number of, a certain number of recertification hours, and they mentioned three hours, but that's for a private applicator, so I hope you caught that. You need 10 hours in category 24, which is ornamental and turf pest control, what you're here today for. 10 hours of recertification credit every five years. Uh, do not wait till the last year to get, try to get all 10 of your certification credits. It may push you a little bit. You may have to drive around the state or the southeast to try to get your certification credit. But if you'll pace yourself and get two or three hours every year uh, or so, then you won't have any problems getting the 10 hours of ornamental and turf uh, pesticide research credit. Um, with that, there are no terms at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, my portion of the training is finished. Uh, I hope everybody makes 100. This was just a quick, simple review of the general standards portion of the, the test, which everybody has to take.